Welcome to another lecture in the course Literature and Identity in the Middle East. I'm Dr. Nikolsky and I'm the coordinator and teacher of this course. <laughs> Today I will speak about imagined communities and about the invention of tradition. Both are titles of books about the modern nation state. And I will also talk about how identity and literature are related to the theory put forward in these books. We will also look into the work of the Lebanese author Amin Malouf and his take regarding identity and the modern nation state. Imagined Communities is the name of a book published by Benedict Anderson in, 18, in 1983. It is, as the subtitle says, reflection on the origin and spread of nationalism. The term nationalism carries a negative connotation, but the meaning of it in this context, in Anderson's context, does not talk about brawling or overexcitement about one's nation, but about the question of belonging, not the, in the emotional way necessarily, at least not in a very emotional way, but as belonging, which is basically institutional. But it does carry some personal engagement that is, it is important and interesting. Benedict Anderson was a Chinese-born Anglo-Irish political scientist and a historian who lived and taught in the United States. So he was a son of an Irish father and an English mother who was born in Kunming, China, as his father was officially stationed there. But the family moved to California in 1941 to avoid the Japanese invasion in the China-Japan War. They later moved back to Ireland and Anderson studied in Eton and later attended King's College in Cambridge, where he became anti-imperialist during the 50s, especially during the Suez crisis. And if you don't know what that is, look it up in 1956. He joined what was then the trend for young pro progressive intellectuals uh, anti-colonial thinking on the basis of Mar Marxist ideology following the social economic theory of Marx. He continued his studies in Cornell University in the United States, writing a PhD in, gover government, in government studies, specializing in Indonesia. He criticized the Indonesian regime, um, their massacre of communists uh, or and alleged communists, um, following the coup d'etat that uh, was happening there and he was then banned from entering Indonesia for a few decades. Anderson studied uh, the origin of nationalism resulting in this book Imagined Communities which was extremely popular. In this book Anderson states what he thinks are the conditions that developed in Europe for the rise, that enabled the rise of a new form of organizing society, the form which we now call nation state. He focuses on some tangible issues, not ideologies, as ideologies die if they are not later anchored in institutions and in materiality. So Anderson talks about the background on which the modern nation state developed, which is the position of personal power and wealth. The place of power within the social system was where people with wealth, it was the royal families and nobility, and after the colonial enterprise, also rich merchants. So the, the transition from, from these sources of power to transition to the bureaucracy as the source of power, that is the structure itself. So the structure itself is empty. Yeah, it's not based on a 
king or the king's offspring or a, a rich person, but it is empty and it is waiting for anyone, the elected candidates in, uh, in democratic systems, to fill it in. And then this person would be the ruler. Such a system can only be activated and achieved uh, when individuals have some level of initiative which results from their knowledge and their agency. And so it is demanding agency. The nation state is, an, is artificial, that is human made, human invention, as other systems too, by the way, including the ones preceding the nation state. It followed the ideologies of enlightenment, secularism, the rise of scientific uh, thinking as the source of authority, yeah, rationality and science. Rationality was the, is until this day, the proper human practice and the idea of progress is embedded in this system as well. So all of these are still our values today to a large extent or to, to some extent. The idea of the nation state is to have a limited sovereign political entity, not depending on the ethnicity or religion or property of the uh, people in it, but on the basis of the unity of the entity as a political unit itself. Since uh, the geographical unit of nation state did not exist before, the border had to be created artificially in agreement with the neighboring units, uh, an agreement which was achieved by negotiation or by war. The inner cohesion of the nation state unit was also made artificially by forcing a, a common language, for example, that is making all local dialects uh, second rate uh, languages, while the official language of the nation state is usually a dialect of the hegemonic province or uh, hegemonic area. Except for unifying the nation state by language, Anderson sees other modern inventions that enabled or enable the existence of a nation state, one of which is the unification of time. The fact that time is the same in all parts of the nation state, time was more local before, enables uh, communication because it enables a railway communication for example uh, and it enables it to be efficient and the train service could encompass the whole po political unit yeah so all all um, yeah the train arrives everywhere in England everywhere in France and it, the, the train system could be properly planned this communication tool the railway was extremely important uh, we are talking about the age before cars and planes, of course, telephones or internet or yeah, and, or anything like this, because it enabled information to travel above all official information of the regime, rules, regulation, events, drawing attention to centralized uh, issues that uh, are declared as important, etc. This is when newspaper became more prominent. Newspaper were originally the way of the regime to tell the population what it wanted them to know, as opposed to the image we have of it now, uh, that the media, media is the watchdog of the regime. It criticizes the regime. No, it was the other way around, originally. But uh, to get back to Anderson, he coined the term imagined community or communities to, re to refer to this unit of the nation state. It is imagined because it's not natural, if I can call, call it so. It's not a natural community where people know each other, but it is declaring that people belong to the same close-knit group, even when they don't really know each other, never met and possibly will never meet. Still, they belong to the same social unit. This means that they have to make a cognitive effort to belong to it. And they have to help, and they do have the help to do it in all these tools that we were just uh, talking about earlier. Unified language, unified time, relevant current information, and common knowledge in general, 
unified educational system, etc. They also have a common identity. Anderson was prompt to understand this phenomena of belonging to an imagined community when he saw the feeling of belonging the people in the colonies had. Children of, let's say, uh, British people born in India, let's say, living there all their lives, still insist that they are British, even though they have uh, never been to Britain and uh, possibly don't know a lot of British people except those in India. So this type of British identity has to be fostered, has to be nurtured, cultivated in order to exist. And then the same is true also for people in the nation state itself, that is not in the colonies. People in France, Germany, Italy, etc., all have to be educated to feel that they belong to the same social unit, since originally in these countries, um, the same area is a conglomeration of many regions that did not necessarily belong together. This might remind you of the effort uh, we should be making in order to feel Europeans, members of the European Union. Yeah, it does not come naturally, it is something that we have to work for. We have to even have the ideology, the motivation and the tools to do this. Back to the original uh, nation uh, state system, except the bureaucratic aspect of sharing common identity card uh, and the technical things of sharing the rail system etc there's a wide area of sharing storied reality narratives stories and histories that tell or create if you want the communality of these national groups this is where invented traditions come into the play. So the invention of tradition or invented tradition is another term that uh, helps conceptualize modern society of the nation state as we see it. The invention of tradition is again a name of a book, in this case a volume of scholarly article ed edited by uh, Eric Hobsbawm, this um, a famous historian born in 1917, died in 2012. British, who also attended King's College, also with a Marxist approach, also born outside of England, in Egypt. He was brought up in Vienna and in Berlin, and before uh, the war he fled to London. He was of Jewish origin, with his adoptive parents, as his own parents died uh, with no connection to the war. Uh, the other editor was uh, Terence Ranger, couldn't find a picture of his. Uh, who was a historian who, after moving to Rhodesia, present day Zimbabwe, he developed views about Rhodesian history which were considered radical and thus leading the Rhodesian authorities to restrict his movement uh, to within uh, three miles of his home. The claim made by the editors and which was supported by the articles in the volume written by a variety of scholars, says that what is called tradition in many instances is in fact not very old and can be traced back to identified uh, and identifiable historical actors, such as the tradition of the uh, tartanry, for example, the, the highland uh, textile patterns, uh, which are claimed to be ancient and point to tribal origin of their wearer. But the tradition, in fact, is quite new, invented uh, for the sake of the tourist industry in the end of the 18th century. And there are more examples of this in the book. The authors say that uh, invented tradition is taken to mean, yeah, I'm quoting from the book, page one, taken to mean a set of practices which automatically implies continuity with the past. In fact, where possible, they normally attempt to establish continuity with a suitable historical past. However, insofar as there is such reference to historical past, the peculiarity of invented in tradition, and they have invented in uh, inverted uh, commas, to, uh, traditions is that the continuity 
with it is largely fictitious. In short, there are responses, these traditions are responses to novel situations which take the form of reference to old situations or which establish their own past by quasi-obligatory repetition. This approach was criticized because the authors seem to still refer to some traditions as real as opposed to the fictitious one. By now, the opinion is that all traditions are invented, not that they are invented from thin air, from scratch, but the cultural canon of any culture is a source of all kinds of possible histories. And the history that is chosen, the one used by the hegemony to create identity, is always the one that is suitable for the current situation for the current influential actors. So when we are looking at identity, any type of social identity, such as the identity theory, which you probably know, uh, we talked about it in the beginning of the course, uh, any identity is also a political statement. It is assignment of oneself to an imagined community and an invented tradition. The fact that these are artificial entities, yeah, the, the identity and the, the tradition and the community, and the fact that these are artificial does not mean that we have a choice not to use them, not to use the identity that our culture suggests, left, right, gay, straight, vegan, keto, etc. We cannot take on an identity which is not organized by our society, which is not suggested by the culture. Even if we are innovative enough to invent one, to come up with such a new type of identity, because this it would still be meaningless because identity is a social thing. It means nothing if no one recognizes it or relates to it. On the social level, I'm, I'm on the social level. Yeah, I'm not talking about psychological identity. I'm talking about social identity. Identity on the social level. The invented, artificial, fictitious, or whatever you want to call it, uh, reality is the only reality that we have. So while we can acknowledge its invented nature, we cannot but relate to it as the reality that is our semiotic reality, our world of meaning. And this is the, our only reality, is the invented reality. Here is where literature comes into play. Literature is a very strong cultural product or cultural, cultural tool for telling the story of the society, telling the reality. This happens whether the literature is recruited to the national struggle, which sometimes it is, or whether it is self-censored, which is sometimes is. But even when it is aiming at expressing personal reality, the social one is always there at the background sometimes because it is disturbing and sometimes simply because this is the reality. So let us see what is the invented reality, but the only reality that is there in uh, Palestinian literature. But we'll start with one who is not really Palestinian. This is uh, the Lebanese author, Amin Malouf. Look at his work, uh, both literary composition as well as uh, some more philosophical uh, ideas that he'd have because he uh, has a very interesting take on the question of um, nationalism and identity. Amin Malouf, Lebanese born, he moved to France in 1976 in the middle or the beginning uh, of the civil war in Lebanon. Until then he was the director of Al Nahar, a big newspaper in Lebanon. He's, he thus gave up his life and career in Lebanon, but made a very good life and career in France. Uh, he's an admirer of uh, European, of Europe and the European way of life. He also writes in French, but the subject of his oeuvre is uh, Lebanon. Lebanese identity or identities uh, and Lebanese issues. In 1983, he published uh, the book, which is called The Crusade Through Arab Eyes, The Crusades Through Arab Eyes, 
yeah so you can get the feeling of what kind of uh, how is uh, in which direction his writing goes and after a few other books he wrote he wrote the book which is called the rock of tanyos in 1993 and he published many books after this as well he was awarded in many awards uh, here you see him um, after receiving the national order of merit by the french government which is a very high uh, award so let us start by listening to a summary of the book, uh, The Rock of Tanius. So The Rock of Tanius, 1993, a novel by the French Lebanese writer Amin Malouf tells the story of a young man embroiled in 19th century Lebanon's political and religious struggle between Egypt, the Ottoman Empire, England and France, and between Islam and Christianity. The summary is taken from here. Yeah, this is the link that uh, that has the summary. Uh, the novel's narrator lives in present-day Lebanon. So the, 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 the one who is telling the story lives in present-day Lebanon. The story is narrated both by historical documents. We get historical documents from Lebanon in the 1830s. And the story told uh, to the narrator by his grandfather's cousin, uh, Gebrail, a 90 years old uh, former historian who is an expert on that time. So let us listen, as I said, from this site. The plot concerns the real history of Lebanon in the 1830s and the mysterious legend of Tanyos Kishk and the rock in his village that is named after him. The Rock of Tanyos is the only one that is named after a person. Tanyos' story was passed from one generation to another. The rock, atop a nearby mountain, is shaped like a seat or a throne, and according to the legend, Tanyos was last seen ascending that mountain and sitting on that rock before mysteriously vanishing, never to be seen again. His fate is still unknown. Local children are warned not to climb or sit on the Rock of Tanyos, lest they, too, disappear. As the narrator learns, Tanyos was born in the little village of Kferiabda to Jerios, the major domo to the village's ruler, Sheikh Francis, and the beautiful Lamia. But rumors circulate as to Tanyos's true parentage. Lamia's beauty is legendary in that region of Lebanon, and some villagers whisper that Tanyos is the product of an affair with the unscrupulous Sheikh Francis. Eventually, Tanyos learns that this is true, Jerios is not his father, and Francis did seduce his mother. In the meantime, Tanyos grows up with the best of everything and is sent to a foreign missionary school for his education. His tutor is the Reverend Stolton, who becomes a mentor and a father figure to the boy. He teaches Tanyos how to treat others with kindness and forgiveness. Stolton's diaries are one of the historical sources the narrator draws upon to tell Tanyos' story. When Tanyos is 15, his hair mysteriously turns white. This is considered an omen, signifying he is marked to become a wise fool. Someone who appears for a brief time once every few generations to right wrongs and seek justice. His life is marked by strangeness and tragedy. Tanyos falls in love with a beautiful young woman named Osma, and they become engaged. They should live happily, but Osma's father, a greedy man, decides he can make a better match. He snatches Osma away from Tanyos and engages her instead to the nephew of the patriarch, a Christian ruler who is also Sheikh Francis's political rival. The patriarch helps to manipulate Osma and her father away from Tanyos. Jerios, furious for his jilted son, acts in anger and murders the patriarch. In the ensuing chaos, Tanyos and Jerios are forced to flee for their lives to Cyprus. There, they become entangled in a religious and political battle. Proponents of Islam and Christianity are fighting for control over the people of Lebanon. In Cyprus, an English Christian spy recruits Tanyos for his own purposes. He hopes to use Tanyos to take down the emir. The emir's own spies find Jerios and hang him for the murder of the patriarch. Tanyos spends much of the book being controlled or manipulated by others, never free to make his own decisions or live for himself. He is, in the end, lenient towards the emir. But when he returns to his home village, his path is unclear. He is victorious, but for the first time, he doesn't know what lies ahead. He climbs the mountain and sits on the throne like rock that will one day be known as the Rock of Tanyos. There, he sees far into the distance. A strip of water seems to stretch out ahead like a path. It is implied that Tanyos found a way to wrest himself free of those who wanted to control him and struck out on his own. But, as the narrator admits, that story is just one version of what might have happened to Tanyos. 
he will never be able to know for sure. Amin Malouf wrote, in the same period in which the theories we talked about earlier were developed, and the question of how accurate historical research is, came to the fore constantly in the historical sciences. Malouf very cleverly used uh, the genre of historical writing, of basing the story upon historical documents, in order to report accuracy, uh, accurately past events. But his historical documents uh, were obviously fictitious. They're, they are only part of the novel. They don't really exist. So by making this combination of historical genre and fictional story, this novel that focuses on the period which is the origin of modern Lebanon creates a modern myth of origin. And as Malouf suggests, a modern myth looks like a historical report. In terms of textual theory, the transition between historical documents to report of uh, hearsay or family tradition by the modern narrator are, are world switches. It is switching between what we as modern people find the most reliable source, historical documents, to what we as modern people find as relatively biased information, personal knowledge. So we see the fragility of information when we see how the teller increments his own knowledge and opinion with each new historical documents that is found. He's zigzagging between the two genres. This story serves at least, uh, at least uh, this story serves, at least this was the intention of Malouf, as the myth of modern Lebanon. It is also perceived as such, it is also perceived as such by the many readers of Malouf's work. The story about the boy whose origin is not completely clear, but only conjectured, whose life was a constant struggle resulting from the many political powers that shaped the areas uh, of today's Lebanon, local and foreign, Middle Eastern and Western, and his disappearance in the end, uh, while the imperial forces continue to play their power game in the area, this is the myth of modern Lebanon. Further, it was written in French. Yeah, the work was written in French by an author who not only does not live in Lebanon and not simply in the diaspora, but lives in France, the great colo uh, colonizer of Lebanon. Malouf, him, uh, Malouf himself writes in uh, in the book origins uh, or in uh, another one other of his book his memoirs that he never felt over um, he never felt overriding loyalty to any one country and that he does not have one country um, as his country diasporic living is not living in displacement or exile it is a life in a country not of one's origin but a peaceful and accepting living in the country. Yeah, so it's not a um, transitional stage. Di diasporic living is living. So Malouf uh, does not go into the discourse about the evilness of colonialism. He ignores negative aspects. In fact, he emphasizes the positive impact that France had on Lebanon. He himself is a lover of French culture. He moved to France, he writes in French, He's very involved in French reality. For this, he has been criticized by many. But for us, this exemplifies how constructed reality is. There's no objective cultural truth, only one which is accepted by the hegemony. Malouf creates a myth, a narrative of Lebanon, in which the people are tossed by games of imperial power, Ottomans, Egyptians, French and British. But Malouf is resisting the national anti-colonial and victimized discourse in his writing, both fiction and non-fiction, as well as in his very own life. In another novel, this one, Ports of Call, he talks about two lovers, the tragic love story of Clara and Ossiane, who were torn 
because of the establishment of the border between Lebanon and the newly founded State of Israel. The couple found themselves at the two opposite sides of the border in the break of the 1948 war. Asiane was visiting his father in Beirut and Clara is in Haifa. Unable to commute be between the two cities as they used to be able to do before the establishment of the State of Israel. 30 years later they meet after the Six Days War uh, enabled uh, movement again. While on the first sight the reader is tempted to associate Clara with Israel and Oceane with Lebanon, the truth is that none of them is solely associated with these uh, countries. As Clara was born in, 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 in Austria, smuggled to Switzerland and then moved to France to fight the, in the resistance against the Nazis. While Oceane, Oceane's origin is half Turkish, half Iranian, so not Arab at all and not Lebanese at all. And he met Clara in the resistance as well. We see here again Maluf's resistance to the comfortable discourse, to the simplistic, and I may say even shallow, of nationalism, uh, as, and which results usually in, in the good and evil, in the division of uh, insiders, outsiders, and, uh, and, and discourse about some kind of unified identity. We have looked at stories from Gaza throughout the first block, and we have looked at Lebanese stories now. Um, both places are tangent to the uh, to the Palestinians in Israel and the West Bank. Gaza is even considered part, part of Palestine, both because of the camps there, uh, and there are many family connections between Gazan people and people in the West Bank, and because before there were borders, uh, there was a continuum from the Sinai Desert to Syria. The whole, the whole area was, was, was one area be before there were nation states. Today we looked a little bit into identity issues in Lebanon, not really concerning uh, Lebanon, but mainly focusing on the constructedness of identity, its artificial nature, albeit an unavoidable issue in the modern culture. Perhaps in the postmodern culture it is again uh, less less necessary the uh, this national identity but uh, uh, we are not uh, all moved to the postmodern period yet and we look shortly also into the question of diaspora and the attitude to colonialism beyond the known one uh, beyond the known one expressed uh, so nicely by edward said all this serves as a good background for looking into unique identity issues Palestinians experience and their unique situation, not only as members of the more modern nation state system, but also as Orientals in the Saidian meaning of it, as well as unique situation within the Arab world. Now it's time for your assignment. For your assignment this week, please read the beginning of Amin Maluf's book, In the Name of Identity, pages 1 until 29. You can find the file below, uh, below this lecture. Maluf claims that a certain attitude toward identity is a recipe for massacre. Explain shortly how this happens on the basis of Maluf's words and on the basis of what you've learned about cancel culture earlier in the course. Submit your assignment of around 200, 200 words in the assignment link below the lecture. Uh, and the deadline is also indicated below. Thank you for listening and I will see you in the seminar.